Hello, and welcome to Lost in Criterion. Once again, I am the Adam Glass, as always, with... John Patrick Oitari Dorgan. I forgot my line. That's there. okay. I, I, always, I always leave it hanging, and then... We'll fix it in post. I always forget we'll that that's in, how it's... We'll po- fix it in post. No, we won't. I know we won't, because I'm the one who's editing this. Yeah, post is going to be... <laughs> I'm just going to put the two sides together and hope they line up and never even listen to them. <laughs> Oh gosh, <laughs> this is going to be a nightmare. episode uh we are talking about uh 1965 jean-luc goddard film uh sci-fi you forgot the name of the film i didn't forget the name okay i did okay no oh there was an um right there that was really (laughs) suspicious because you were interrupting me no no um if if i had known you were interrupting me it would mean i'm psychic and that would be awesome amazing Um, and you wouldn't have to watch any more of the films right i could just know them this is Alphaville. It is a sci-fi sort of noirish uh, detective story. Everything you say is going to have to be prefaced with sort, sort of. of everything. Everything in this movie, it's sort of sci-fi, <laughs> sort of noir, yeah. sort of film, okay, sort of French. So, um, <laughs> literally, John Luc Goddard French. is a uh, he's he's French New Wave, but he's sort of avant-garde in his French New Wave ness. Um, Whereas, whereas 400 Blows was our first experience with the French New Wave, and 400 Blows is a very realistic, gritty sort of story take on the French New Wave. This is, there's a grittiness to this, but it's a very, it's a weird... It's more like the grittiness <laughs> you get if you just don't use a real camera yeah. or something. I don't know. Like, it's like, it's a different, yeah, like, uh, 400 Blows is grittiness is more... Yeah, derived both from the story, but also the way it's yeah. shot and everything. This is more just feels like a dude. It literally feels like guerrilla filmmaking yeah. throughout it the really entire does. thing. There's a couple dudes you see like at desks and stuff when 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 the main character runs out of the building, like who are looking. It's not. Like, he didn't know he was. Yeah, being it's filmed, not clear he? that they know they're in a movie. <laughs> yeah, it's, a lot of these people are not aware that they're participating in a movie, much less a science fiction yeah. movie. So it. It stars Eddie Constantine, who is an American expatriate, moved to France, uh, began acting, and actually played the Lemmy Caution character, his character in Alphaville, um, in a lot of different movies from a lot of different directors. Um, so this is kind of like if, uh, one, Sean Connery were still playing James Bond, and two, John Waters got the new contract to record the next James Bond film. This is kind of kind of what Alphaville is. <laughs> <laughs> In a lot of ways, it's kind of like the first Batman yeah. movie. Not, not. Oh, well, sorry, not the '60s Batman movie, but um, you know what yeah. I'm talking about the the, the late '80s one. When when it's yeah, it's, if you decided to take Batman in a really weird direction, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. So let me caution is kind of this James Bondish character. He's created in 1936 by a British pulp writer uh, Peter Cheney. Um, He's an FBI agent, a noir detective. Um, here, uh, he's played as this really Humphrey Bogart-esque uh, noir PI, even though he's a he's a secret agent in the movie. Um, and it's it's a weird sci-fi. This it's very clearly shot wherever they could uh, in 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 and around Paris. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, wherever they could get away yeah. with shooting it, again. Doesn't seem like they got yeah, permission. It has anything. It has a feel like no one, no one bothered with any permits here. Um, and it takes place in this advanced sci-fi sort of alternative present from the feel of it. There's not a lot of indicators of time, but uh, the well, but they they do make some references yeah. to Le- semi-contemporary. Yeah, let me caution. At the time says himself that he's a uh, he's a veteran of Guadalcanal, for instance. Um, and 
there's a few other references sort of like that. And obviously the main villain who calls himself Von Braun, he is not Werner Von Braun, but is a reference to him. And he has a lot of parallels to that sort of scientist in the mid-century, mid-20th century. <clears throat> he's, he's kind of in exile, but he's run away and started the city in, an, in another galaxy. Um, <laughs> yeah, which is really, for most of the film, a little confusing <laughs> until you realize that he's just calling other places galaxies. Yes, yes. and no... He has decided to use exclusively interstellar travel terminology to describe commonplace yes, phenomena. Yes. So this, I mean, this, as far as as far as the uh, happenings are concerned, this might as well just be Alaska. But <laughs> but all of everything else is referred to as the Outlands and is referred to as being in other galaxies. Um, and in the sort of uh, devil temptation moment of our main character, he's offered the ruling of another galaxy. Um, but it didn't really work out that way because let me cut, like this is one of those weird incompatibilities between the storyline and the main character. Yeah. In my opinion, okay, like the Wikipedia points out that oh, they're in such great contrast. Out like uh, whatever it's Alpha sixty, the computer and. Let me caution are just complete opposites. Yeah. But here's my problem. Let me caution doesn't even think about it for more than like a millisecond. Yeah. He's like, screw that, I don't need to run another galaxy. Blah, blah, blah. And like it's really like this film is supposed to be so like this yeah. like, you know, they put this like weird utopian future that's sort of at the same time dystopian and then like you're supposed to have a main character who reflects on the nature of it. And is it right or is it wrong? But instead you've got, um, let me call Yeah, he's not, he's not really reflecting. Who shoots his way through things. Yeah, he's, he's, he's this gut reaction. And in a way that is, that is reflective because the entire, the premise, the premise of the city then is it's run by this computer called Alpha 60 and Alpha 60 has outlawed emotions. It runs everything by cold logic. Um, or, or that's what we're told. Actually, every time we hear him talk, uh, he's he's usually quoting Borges poetry. Um, so, right, which is which, amusing. Which is yeah. like magical realism, and it's not it's not it's not cold <laughs> logic at all. That's for sure. Uh, anyway, he's running everything on cold logic. It's uh, it's outlawed in motion. So let me caution to that diametrically opposed state um, is very shoot from the hip. Um, in fact, all his shooting, right, all his shooting does from the hip. That. Even the shooting he uh, he thinks about, he does from the hip, uh, literally. Right. Um, because that's how he holds his gun, which doesn't seem like, good. A, but... a, yeah, it doesn't seem like a way to make sure you hit yeah. people. But what I'm saying is not so much that he is not diametrically opposed so much as in the nature of the story, what the director obviously wants to accomplish. Yeah. He's not the best main character you could have for it. In that, like, you do want that sort of thinks with his gut, yeah. you know, emotional-based character, right? But you also want one that kind of seems... Like, even though, like, Alpha, Alpha 60 complete, like just calls him, like, you're, you're obviously of superior intelligence. Let me caution is... Does not strike me at all that way, right? Yeah. It doesn't seem like he's that way. And so, like, you're you right. end up... It's more, it comes off more feeling like um, if you let a monkey loose in a, in like a, <laughs> I don't know, IBM factory. Well. Then it does, you know what I mean? He's angry at the things he doesn't understand rather than. Yeah. Like resisting them on principle yeah. is what it feels yeah. like. Like I understand that Lemmy Caution has principles, but because of his run, gun, shoot from the hip, and also just his general way of talking and acting. It really comes off like he's the one who's ignorant, and Alpha Sixty might actually be in the yeah. right. Well, and I, I obviously like from a analysis perspective, no, obviously Alpha Sixty's run on pure logic that's actually based on emotional poetry. Yeah, doesn't make any sense. But the point is, is that Lemmy Caution makes it seem like Alpha Sixty might be the good yeah. guy. The way the way he's reacting, <laughs> or, or at least it's in the so right. So there is yeah. there is. Obviously, beyond the problem of uh, the killing of anyone who shows emotion, Alphaville's not that bad a place from what we see. Um, yeah, except for 
man, the way they choose to kill the people with emotion is so <laughs> weird. Yes, yes. They talk about the former execution method, uh, which was... Oh, we used to use these electric chairs. Which was to electric it's like, people while they're... But then we went to something more civilized. <laughs> Swimming women who stab you after you've been shot. Yeah, yeah. And why... It's like, what? The, the, okay, everybody lines up by the pool. They walk out onto one at a time. They walk the plank. They're standing on the end of the diving board and get gut shot by a line of guys with machine guns who, instead of killing the guys... Just shoot them oh, in the right. gun. Shoot them in the Then they yeah. fall into the water, and most of them are not dead, so they continue to swim. And five women who are dressed slowly, dressed like they are in a, uh, a, a synchronized swimming team, swim after him, stab him, uh, and drown knives. him. With small with knives. Very yeah. small knives. <laughs> drown like him. Like pocket knife. And drown him. Um, and then re- Can and you then imagine the, body. the cleanup yes. on that? Yes. <laughs> Like, it doesn't make any sense. This is the most absurd method of public this execution is, I could possibly think of. There is no, there is no logic to the, to the form of right, execution. Right, right. We're, what is with Alpha... Uh, <coughs> again, we get into this thing. It's like Alpha 60, yes, is a computer. And yeah. so, in theory, f- f- the premise of the movie is that it is a purely logical, like, being, okay? Yeah. Who is both sentient but lacks com- completely lacks emotion. Actually, I should say sapient. Yeah. Um, but the point is, is that um, obviously it's not. It's a lunatic. <laughs> yes. And, and who cooks up absurd ways to publicly execute yeah, thought this criminals. Is, this is one of the only... It's logically inconsistent to how the character, how the computer is portrayed elsewhere with this. And, this, and, and the problem is that this is the only place where he's actually evil. Is that this is happening, um, yeah. and it just doesn't fit with right, the rest right. of how it's, it's almost portrayed. Like the director was like, "Man, the computer's not coming off bad enough, so let's throw this in there." Yeah, and then all the people are watching, including like, you know, um, Von Braun, and it's like they clap after every one. It's horrifying. Yeah. And I guess that's the notion. Is let's he, like uh, the director. Like, what's the most horrific way you could execute a man <laughs> possible? And then and then he cooked this up, and he's like, but then never bothered to stop and think. Would a computer think this? Yeah. Well, it's, like, it's like someone. It's like he thought, what's the most horrific way you could kill a man and still have it be completely absurdly hilarious? Right, right. What's the most absurd way you could kill a man and still have it fit well with classical music? Ah. <laughs> yes. uh. Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's like, a ridiculous it's, it's, thing. Actually, on your well, and the, uh, and the weird thing is, is they talk about going from the other method, yeah. which is very reasonable. Okay, not reasonable, but it fits a computer way of thinking. Yeah, this this distract people and then electrocute them and then just dump right, their bodies. And then just dump them. Yeah. yeah, that is that is like and a yet, reasonable way to do a thing. Except it does not work if you want to have a crowd of people watch and clap after each one. Uh, so, right. so in a way, right, right, right. I mean, in a way, it's trying to equate. <laughs> right. Perhaps it's trying to equate this, uh, the uh, the atrocities of the society of this dictatorship with you know Rome and the Colosseum in a way, and that's I guess that, that execution but, but, but has become like a form a, of entertainment. But execution's only but that's like an apples and oranges sort of thing yeah, at the same yeah, time. You exactly. Know? It's not, and then it's entertainment for like eight guys. Yeah, for for eight people watching. It's not like it's public. Like it's not like we don't see it like being televised or anything. Yeah. It would suddenly change meaning if he had done that. Yeah. If we had scenes of people watching this at home or something yeah. and clapping at home, then suddenly it takes on a totally different vibe. But instead we've just got like eight they look like kind of like weirdos, like pervs. It's like yeah. it doesn't even seem like Alpha Sixty cooked this up. It's like they suggest it. You know what would be cool, Alpha Sixty? <laughs> If we could stand up on a balcony and watch these swimmers stab this dude to death. <laughs> he's all like, fine, and, whatever. And he's like, all right, whatever. <laughs> I've got to plan an invasion. Right, right. Do what you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very, it's... This is not a logical way of killing people. It is not. No, and this, yeah. It's, and it kind of, it's it really kind of ruins the idea of cold logic being the enemy here. Because... Right, but so does everything that Alpha Sixty says. Yes, that's true too. Like, I'm talking about the circle of poetry. life. Poetry, yeah, 
Yeah, right? Like, I'm waiting for Alpha 60 to leave a drum circle. Yeah, there is no past, there is no future, everyone lives in the present. Uh, it's, it's not... It's really weird. It's this it, weird existentialism, but it's not logical existentialism, it's poetic existentialism. Yeah, and like... I don't know. I got. I gotta get something off my chest. I meant to do this earlier okay. in the podcast. Part of my problem is I kind of hate poetry. <laughs> all right. Not exclu- Not all poetry, but most poetry. Okay. Okay. I'm. You gotta accept this as a fact, okay? To understand, that, like, basically what the director did here was take sci-fi, my basically my favorite genre of film book and everything and then impregnate it with a nazi baby yes that's what it feels nazi like nazi babies in space yeah maybe like yeah something that's a great i can't idea. even th- I, i'm trying to think of a way to explain how yeah unhappy this film made me yeah because i don't have at its heart a problem with the premise of the film yeah Th- i like science fiction i like I especially like alternate like realities. Yeah. Like not out, but you know, what I mean, alternate presents. Those are always neat. Yeah. But then, especially when they're like kind of supposed to maybe make a point about our society and where it's going and what it's doing, but then you just throw a lot of poetry in it, and I'm trying to watch it, and I'm thinking, God, can we just get through the poetry parts? Because sometimes Alpha 60 talks for like 10 or 15 minutes straight. Yeah. Why does a computer need a soliloquy in that <laughs> god awful voice? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just as long as we're as long as we're having confession time, uh, I have attempted in my life to watch Alpha Bill three times, and three times <laughs> I have fallen asleep. Dude. Oh <laughs> man. Well, I got it. Mom. This is this should just be confession time with Pat and Adam. I'm not gonna lie. I watched this film 15 minutes before you called. Is when I finished it. All right, all right. I've been putting it off for three weeks. Yeah. Because like, like all I had to do was read the Wikipedia. I'm like, oh no. I'm not really interested in this. Okay. <laughs> it's it's interesting actually. You in in your little your little diatribe there. You you called it. It's like a monkey was loosed in in IBM fa- an IBM factory. Yeah, they wanted to call it. It's Tarzan actually uh, versus IBM. yeah. Uh, Goddard wanted the original title of the film to be Tarzan versus IBM, um, which which is such. Uh, it it really encapsulates the ridiculousness uh, that is this sort of you know shoot from the gut character versus versus this cold logic. Um, but at the same time, uh, that's not really how it plays out in the movie. Right. It's a, it's all so... Ugh. It's, I, but I need to get back to the point of one thing. Why did we need the poetry? Is it just because it's a French film? I... I and this guy is... Cr- the director is crazy French? I don't know. I don't understand. Like, it's not even a French poet. Yeah. I don't. I, it, it, it really I don't necessarily bothered. understand the choice of Borges. Um, I think, in a way, you said you could have used so many other writers yeah. who necessarily aren't necessarily poets, but you could have even found poets who match the theme. Yeah. Well, one of the themes of this movie is sort of caution, accepting his fate as a legend, um, and. In that regard, the opening and a lot of the uh, the sort of class that Natasha is in when Lemmy finds her that second time, um, where we where we really get like fifteen minutes of Alpha sixty talking. Um, yeah, they're all quotes from a Borges essay called "Forms of a Legend." Um, so you know, it's it's reflective of what he wants to make out of. <laughs> Let me caution. He wants to make it this this legend character, this dude becoming more than himself by by rescuing the society. But the society, I, I, there's besides the emotional repression and the use of tranquilizers for and not exactly forced, but forced under duress. I mean, if they show emotion, they'll be put to death. So everyone takes their own tranquilizers. Um, right, but yeah. besides that, um, this isn't like 
an evil place. And I don't know if no, that is not. necessarily, and that doesn't work within what what else we're shown of of this place. That doesn't work. Um, and with the computer quoting Borges all the time, it really doesn't work. But that's what I'm saying is like I, I yeah okay yeah so you've got the whole hero becoming a legend thing yeah. which also seems like a stupid point for this film. Well, it's it's individualism yeah. versus a collectivism, and it's you know that's kind of reading too much into it. He is in, he is the individual versus the collective Alphaville, but Alphaville is we never get a feel that Alphaville is ne- necessarily this collective. I mean, we see all this. Right. You, we don't really a... see normal citizens who aren't in their own way fighting it. We, I mean, we have all of the uh, seductresses who are just doing their job and might as well be robots. But, um, but other than that, really the normal citizens, the ones who are not part of some bureaucratic process somewhere, are the people in that apartment where he finds the uh, other agent, uh, Dixon. And right. and they're all sitting in the lobby, and they're strung out, and they're clearly strung out, but they're also, you know, reading a novel out loud, and just sitting around smoking and having sex. <laughs> it's not... Right, exactly. It's like, <clears throat> well, and then, it's really... Yeah, it doesn't... I understand the idea, but, like, if I have to compare, this film is so much like 1984. Yeah. And 1984 is so much better than this film. Yeah, as far as as far you know what I mean. It's yeah. like it's got a very similar, like yeah, kind of storyline. And I understand that you know 1984 is not about a hero be- or like a person becoming a legend. But then again, I understand that's sort of a collective versus individual thing. But yeah. at the same time, that's it's almost like he piled too many ideas into it and couldn't really flesh them all out. Well, you said... Because you could do Hero Becoming a Legend in a much more conducive context yeah. One thing than one, Dystopian Future. One thing you said earlier was that it felt very much like a guerrilla film. And I think that's true uh, in a greater extent. I really feel like when, when Goddard was putting this together, um, he took everything he likes and everything he'd been thinking about, no matter how disparate it might be. And he put it into a movie. So we've got the sci-fi. The book I was reading last weekend. You know, we've got the sci-fi. We've poetry. got the film noir. We've got the poetry. We've got this dystopian future versus the individualist. And none of it necessarily... T- one or two of them would work together. Three or four yeah, of them. But the whole package, but the doesn't, whole package mesh very well. doesn't mesh very well. And that is like unfortunate. It's weird because like some of the ideas are really cool, especially the fact that he was able at the time to use like modern architecture yeah. in France as a setting because it was so new yeah. that it made a good setting for a futuristic society. Yeah, that and at the same cool. at the same time modernist architecture is itself sort of this cold thing. Um it's very right. it's very utilitarian, so it's not right, and that <clears throat> works great. Like yeah. if he had just made that basic, yeah, welcome to this dystopian alternate universe, and then I'm going to introduce this sort of shoots from the gut guy who doesn't belong here, and, and then sort of watch watch the explosions, like yeah. watch what happens when you mix these two things together. It's fine, but then Alpha Sixty starts quoting poetry. Yes. Yes. And things like that, and it just takes it derails it. It makes it feel it does. It does less meaningful. I do. I do appreciate the way, uh, and you you already compared it to 1984, so we'll call it Newspeak. The way it sort of controls language is that there is a a Bible, what they call a Bible in each room. It's actually a dictionary, and uh, it's continuously things updated. Are <laughs> words are removed. Words are added, um, and uh, if they evoke too much emotion words are outright manned, and then if it's not in the dictionary anymore, no one remembers it. <laughs> yeah, I really thought it was funny when she started listing words that, like, have been banned. Yeah. And some of them, like, okay, tenderness, understood. But red breast? Yes. Is that just a mistranslation in my, in my, in my copy of the film? I, I, what I, does that even mean? I, I think it's kind of like how... Isn't that a uh, type of bird? It is a type something? of bird, but I think it's, I think it's like in Victorian England, uh, Edwardian England, uh, when we started calling... 
uh, parts of a chicken, white meat and dark meat, and so that we wouldn't have to use the words breast and leg because they were making uh, making men too horny or something. Um, yeah, but at the same time, this is a, a society that has paid seductresses. Well, but yeah. So obviously, it's not prudish. It's not. It's not. It's, it's, it's not as prudish. Practical. It's true. It's but it's so uh, it's so repressed that that anything can become. Uh, yeah, this is yeah. red breast was really yeah. funny in the list. I was like, wait, what? Actually, it's it's very interesting to me the way the seductresses seem to work. At least the way. Uh, the way Dixon interacts, because he he dies during his interaction with the uh, with the seductress that right. we see, um, he kind of has a heart attack in it. But they never really they kiss a lot, um, but it's not even implied that there's something sexual coming uh, any more than it's just it's more of an emotion. He kept he keeps saying and he says in English, he says in French, he says in Russian because he's supposed to be a Russian character. Um, I love you over and over again. So it's it's more like it's an emotional prostitution than yeah, which is weird in a society that it's weird. Is it supposed yeah. to like weed out people who exhibit too much emotion? Maybe or I maybe. don't really understand. Or is it a way you can outlet your emotions there, without yeah. real interaction with other human beings? Or but like there's not implied sexuality there. Yeah, but. When she's at the very beginning, oh when yeah, they hop in the bath with him, there is, and yeah. so it's like that's certainly true. That is, it's true. hard to comprehend what the. It's like, the director was like, you know what? In my future, that I'm afraid of, sexuality will be, like, uh, I don't know, yeah. formalized via bureaucracy or something like that. And it's like. But then you didn't bother to codify that information enough <laughs> yeah. to make it like comprehensible to a viewer. Yeah, yeah. Basically, I think the director was on drugs. Oh, all things weird. Dra- all things no, weird are normal no, all in this horror of a city. It's something he says, and that doesn't. That's not even true. It's not just yeah, weird. It's, it's weird. things that it really just don't make sense. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's like it's like I really feel like the director maybe didn't have a script. Yeah. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he didn't. It's possible. Maybe he's just like, do this now. It is awesome. It is good to know, I think, at this point, that uh, there is is a story that the German backers of the film, upon seeing it, demanded their money back. And (laughs) rightfully so. (laughs) Rightfully so. In my opinion. Like, not because it's a absolute terrible film, but, like, if you were paying for a Libby Caution, like, spy action film, and this is what you got, you'd be pretty pissed. Yeah. No, I I completely like we agree. We paid you how much money, and then what did you spend that money on? Because it <laughs> appears that you just ran into buildings and shot shots before the security showed up. Well, we had and a, then just we used had it a, on below. We had a lot of donuts. Yeah, right. <laughs> there is. Um, he he subscribes know, I mean, to the. It's better to ask for or, uh, ask for forgiveness than permission. Yes, I I mentioned and that does this exclusive with donuts. This seems to be a sort of amalgamation of everything that. Uh, that the director writer was into at the time, uh, <laughs> right, right, and you know, there's there's the weird sort of pop culture and and commercialism aspects of that too. So we get our we get the Ford Galaxy, um, the car that that Lemmy right, drives right, again, not fleshed out. We get not this one out. little glimmer of that, and then it's like, yeah. oh. And another little glimmer we get is when he first meets Dixon. He asks about other agents, Dick Tracy. And Guy Leclerc, which is Flash Gordon, his original French right. name. <laughs> so, so you know these little pop culture references that we completely gloss, gloss over because they're dead, and let's never talk about them again. Um, so we right, yeah. So we we see them, we hear about them for just a few seconds, and it's like yeah. Oh, let's be sad. Okay, and let's somehow we're existing in maybe this universe is also solipsist, and like things that we have dreamed of or. Are... <laughs> real so dix tracy is a real person and yeah. so is Guy hey, Leclerc, claire in this it's like what all uh all fiction is true in this universe we also don't don't see the rest of that but why not yeah right why not since since we only hint at other things so much let's let's determine that to be true <laughs> right for this society it just feels like he like has he was like just had a stack of like Weird books at his house, and just flipped through, and, like took one little piece out of each one, and said, like, yeah. "I've got a film." So why not? You Professor know, von Braun's you know original name is Leonard Nosferatu. He's the real Nosferatu. He's actually a vampire. Let's make it that. Right? Why not? 
Why on earth would anybody be named that? Yeah. And so, like, really what I'm getting down to is this is so much like a film that a high school student would make. It hurts. Yes. Because it's got that weird gorilla thing where they're not going to ask for permission. They're going to ask for forgiveness. Yeah. And then it's just a weird amalgamation of whatever cool, like, stuff that the director thought was cool. Yeah. It's like, it's exactly like a high school student film. It really is. It really is. And that's unfortunate. Um, so let's see. Uh, there, are, there are moments, though. There are moments that I really, really liked. Do um, tell. And, and most of them, most of them blow apart the, uh, the high school student making this movie theory. And one, one of them is a very early scene, and it's the way it's shot. Um, okay, well, that, but that's a different thing. Like, he yeah. does, considering that I don't think he asked for permission, a lot of these shots are pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so we get, when, when Lemmy first checks into his hotel, um, first off, the, the camera follows him, sort of. No, I, let's see this one. Um, the sort of introduction of, of caution. We get a bunch of, as the movie opens, we get a bunch of just random stills. And we get the voiceover, which we later learn is Alpha 60, quoting Borges, that says, Sometimes reality is too complex for oral communication, but legend embodies a form which enables the spread around the whole world. And then as he finishes that line, we get our first shot of caution driving okay, his car. Okay, and we're going to have to come back to that quotation because... Huh. <laughs> hey, Just later, okay? He's an, Argent he's an Argentinian magical realism poet. Uh, we don't right, really... Right, which I don't understand. There's, because, there's nothing to understand. Okay, because, like, it doesn't make any sense. Legends themselves are Our oral, oral communi communication. Yes, exactly. Yeah. exactly. And more, like, uh, yeah, sorry. Well, just, no, legends, that's, that's kind of what it's saying. Uh, Reality is too complex, so we... we we break it down right. into is legends. Is possibly the result that it was translated into French and then the French was translated <laughs> into English rather than just translating straight from maybe, Portuguese? Maybe. I, maybe. I, I just don't understand because... Spanish. Like, He's already that, to the end. Or, it would be Spanish. Oh, I thought, I thought you said he was Brazilian. I could have sworn I read he was... Okay, I'm sorry. I swear. Yeah, I, I think he's Argentinian. I don't... Okay. Well, I, then I suppose Spanish. I don't know that for sure. Well, eh, it's not really relevant to the conversation, but the point <laughs> is that, like... When I heard that, like, I almost zoned out right there. Because I was like, this doesn't make any sense. So legends themselves are one of the most practical forms of oral communication to pass well, on that's, a story. Well, that's what right? it's saying. Legend, right, I know, leg but it's saying that oral communication is not complex enough to deal with the universe. So legends... But then, like, it also references the idea that legends spread throughout the world, which is pretty much identifiably false. Um, well, no, not necessarily. And, I, know, I know I'm arguing with an anthropologist at this point. Well, but, I'm just saying that, like, but, you you do get some similar themes. Yeah. But that's because the human condition is but you still, pretty you much get, universal. There, there are legends, you know, and I don't want to get too far into, <laughs> too far into this, this sort of argument. This is going to be so much fun. But there are certain, Let's just there do are this certain, for the rest of the There podcast. are legends that exist sort of prenatally in in society yes yeah and you do get some of that you but know? then again you're also dealing but that's more dealing with the fact that uh, and that's, everybody descending from common ancestors yeah. that's not just that's not just historic form that's not just historic form that's that's you know everybody and the common ancestor thing too and and, and so and, yeah it's like did yeah. it spread around the world no it spread to like a couple thousand dudes and then they spread mm -hmm. around the world and, you know, I mean, I just didn't like it because it's, it was really like, it's like, I said that I hate poetry and I yeah. don't, I hate poetry that is at you, least purposely oblique. You hate poetry that thinks too much of itself. Yes, I do. Yeah. And I especially hate it when it's translated to three languages to get to me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. So basically this dude was reading, like, so that's the thing is about Alpha 60 is that I basically had to read nonsense for like 15 minutes at a time when he was yeah. talking. That's really hard well, to do. That's... that's like reading Shakespeare when you don't have a firm grasp on the vocabulary being like. Well, the other the other uh, problem uh, the other problem with what we're doing here is that he's not quoting verbatim an entire work. 
So it's right. like so it's really it's, like mix and match and yeah. It's like a last poor Yorick to sweet to sleep perchance to dream. <laughs> right. If Alpha Sixty had just <laughs> said that randomly, I would have been like, "What is Alpha Sixty talking about?" Yeah. Sorry, yeah, go on to your cinematography I mean, it's thing. Not, I'm it's sorry. It's not quite that bad, but still, but at it the same feels time, pretty bad. At the same time, you know, when when a poem has its own point. So if you're just quoting parts of a poem, you're not necessarily getting a point. Right. Yeah, and while yeah. while an yeah. author an author generally, especially you know the sort of uh, sort of man writing the poet the sort of poetry that Borges writes, um, he has an overarching point. He's trying right, to get to at the same the thing yeah. with all of his work. Are trying to get right. at the same basic ideas. Right. And that's why you get collections. Yeah. But, right. But, yeah. Uh, but at the same time, just quoting individual works kind of at random. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't work. Work. work, right. Like, let okay. me rephrase what I said. I said I don't like poetry <laughs> because it's a way more dramatic way to say it. I do not like random quotation of poetry in yeah. a non- or seemingly nonsensical fashion. Yeah. I do actually like collections of poetry where I can really dig into the meaning of it yeah. without trying too terribly hard. <laughs> yes. But... Like, when it's just, like, some... It, again, yeah, it's, like... Like, if... Yeah, if just Alpha 60 just started spouting random poetry, <laughs> yeah. which is what he does... Yeah. It's like, huh? Okay. So, okay. okay. Go on to so, your cinematography discussion. Cinematography. It's probably way better and more interesting. <laughs> no, one thing One thing I really loved was... Uh, so, he gets out of his car at the hotel, and we kind of follow him out of the car, and there's this... this it's a short... It's a relatively short shot, but but it's great... In that he walks into the rotating door of the hotel, and the uh, the, the camera cameraman spins around with him. The cameraman gets into the very next division of the rotating door and spins around with him. Mm. Uh, then we get a really quick cut, which which was kind of needless because if they had kept this going, you know, through the rest of the uh, through the rest of the scene, considering the next we we cut right there, and the next shot is like you know two minutes long. If we hadn't had that cut, it would be a little more impressive. But then from the desk, onto elevators, up the stairs, and through these winding hallways until he gets to his room is one single shot. You know and what my guess is for that cut? Security guard. Maybe. maybe at the building. Hey, you kids, you can't do that. <laughs> what are you kids doing in here? No, apparently, apparently they had to have had permission at least here because because the uh, the elevator scene took many many cuts um because what happens is uh it's it, there's two glass elevators side by side and lemmy gets into one and the cameraman gets into the other and they hit the buttons at the same time so they go up and we watch him going up as if we're outside the elevator um yeah which you know any any other person would have done with a rig on the outside of the elevator or a stick <laughs> Or a stick, but we do we do by putting our cameraman in the other in the other elevator, which is a great idea and a wonderful little idea. And he gets out, and we continue to follow him. It's a him. great idea <clears throat> in theory. Yeah, and it, it, it works in practice. It's hard to pull off. It works there, and they did it enough that it works there. But later, he and Natasha are in his room, and they leave the hotel, and they do the same you know winding hallway shots, following them as they talk. And uh, they get on the elevator and go down. And they do the same thing, except they don't time it right. So for about five seconds, we watch the top of their elevator from yeah. the other elevator <laughs> before we both hit the floor. <laughs> and uh, they should have retaken that shot a couple more times, and I don't understand why they didn't. Well, maybe um, they were just like, oh, God, this is taking too long. Yeah. Screw it. So there's that there's a lot of there's a lot of starkness in the framing and the and the color and well not the colorization but the 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 contrast of the shots and that's good a good black and white movie needs to have that that contrast well especially if you're trying to pull off a sort of noir vibe too yeah yeah um and and where they shoot we mentioned earlier uh their use their use of modern architecture so there well, there are good there are good things in this movie, and there are good reasons that I tried three times to watch this movie. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but 
But overall, there are also problems with this movie as we yeah. uh, we spent the first twenty minutes. Talking yeah. About. Well, oddly enough, the ar- the modern architecture thing really is probably the most impressive thing for me because yeah. as a person at that time, it would have seemed fantastical mm-hmm. for most people, right? Because we're talking this is the very pretty much the very beginning of that sort of style of architecture, right? Yeah. This is like when, you know, weird buildings start showing up in cities where you're going, huh? Um, But then, like, at the same time, now that we have gotten so far beyond that, I mean, we've kind of gone past that. We've come out the other side. Looking back and watching it, it also looks futuristic in a weird way because it's absurd. You know what I mean? Like, coming from a world where... Uh, coming from a, you know, a world where a lot of utilitarian buildings are just concrete squares at this point, because turns out yeah. the most efficient way to make a building is that, right? Yes. We're no longer interested in making it attractive, right? Or not very attractive. I mean, we all went to high school, right, and college, yes. and most of the buildings we were inside of were brick or were concrete squares, yes, or rectangles, right? It's weird to look back because it looks kind of futuristic from the other side. It sure it looks like 60s future. Like that yeah. sort of like, you know, clocks in the shape of like a, like a, a like a, that, that, that original model of a, a, uh, an atom. But like that sort of future and like weird plastic bucket seats that they still had at my university when I was there. Yes. Yes. Made out of that crappy orange plastic. Um, but it still has that weird future vibe. And that's, yeah. that's kind of interesting to me. It, it was a kind of amazing that I could watch it and think this is the future. Yeah. There's without no... it, but yet knowing that this is totally not the future. Yeah. There's one more thing I want to call attention to because I'm not really sure how I feel about it. Okay. And that that is uh, within the soundtrack of the film. There is a lot of utter silence. Yeah. Where they completely cut out all audio and. And at some points, it's to lead into sort of an internal monologue. And maybe the entire point of them is that it's an internal monologue, but he does He's not really sure what to think yet, so he's gathering his thoughts before he says something. But, uh, but yeah, just, like, part of the French New Wave that, and, and certainly something we saw with 400 Blows and something we see here is this sort of uh, no post-production, very little post-production audio. And microphones just kind of there and pick up whatever you pick up. Right, and so you get, sometimes you get high, low, yeah. Yeah, and background noise is fine and, and don't worry about it. So the majority of this has that sort of background noise. And almost, you know, we keep coming back to this whole high school production idea. It's almost like, you know, the microphone's mounted on the front of the camera and we hear whatever we hear. If it's windy, right, what's then at, there's a yeah. big whining thing. Um and and that's why it stands in such stark contrast when we cut out all that audio. Because See, and it is I thought that was kind of silence. neat. I yeah. like it when films use that sort of weird audio. I don't know if that was terribly on purpose or not. Yeah. Um, I it, because of the weird high school production feel of it, it also feels like, oh, we did this part in the studio, and there's no background noise on this, so yeah, ta-da! Here's some silence. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, but the the net effect is like when, for example, Alpha sixty or somebody's going to talk, and like, yeah. or the you know, you get that inner monologue. You do get this deafening silence, which I kind of like. I think it's like yeah. because Alpha sixty is everything. Because it's so jarring that it, yeah, it pulls your attention back to it. Right, and I actually like that. And had Alpha sixty been saying things that were worthwhile, <laughs> um. <laughs> Or at least comprehensible. Yeah. It would have actually had a really positive effect on the film for me. And even then, it did have a positive effect. It just was like... Instead, it was to warn me that I was going to zone out for the next ten minutes. <laughs> um, I, and, you know, I'm harping on the poetry thing too much. But it just... I really didn't like that. It's like... I don't yeah. know what you're talking about, computer. I understand when, like... Windows gives me an error better than this. I would have preferred if he just talked in weird technical jargon. It doesn't make yeah. a lot of sense. But instead we get like this weird, I don't understand poetry. And then 
<laughs> it's preceded and followed by deafening silence, which I thought was cool. Like, I did not like Alpha 60's voice. That made yeah. me angry. I found myself getting angry at the presence of Alpha 60's voice. <laughs> not just because of what he was saying, because obviously it's all in French, so I don't understand it anyway. Well, you're but, probably a bad person for that. Um, with because the voice? The voice is actually the uh, mechanical, well, electronic voice box of a man who had his... Uh, had his larynx doesn't uh, matter. I hate removed. it removed. <laughs> so you're. Uh, you I would like to point people. out. I would like and, to point uh, out that my my mother grew up in a small place called Pikeville, Kentucky, and every uh-huh. time I went to visit Grandma, I ran into about eight of those guys <laughs> at the at her at her um, uh, what is it uh, government subsidized housing. Okay, so, so I hated you... them too. I didn't hate them because they were disabled. <laughs> I hated them because that is the most awful sound in the world. <laughs> So you just have this, uh, you just have this uh, childhood fear of. I of think voices. so. It's like, possible. Uh, I really don't like that kind of like that. That sound really. Yeah. Oh no. The, that's the, really like, ultra low. Li- yeah. Yeah. It's it's, it's no. It, it bothers me too. Like it's um, it's. I'm fine with like you know your sort of generic electronic sound like voice, yeah. but that was more. That was like, what are we doing here? There was one other weird thing in the soundtrack that I'm I'm not sure what meant, but but less less weird. Uh, there's all there's these like triple beats every so often. These, okay. these loops. This is boop boop boop. Yeah, um, I think um, yeah, I don't. I think that's supposed to indicate, like, at, at certain points in the film, it seems to indicate that like Alpha Sixty is going to talk, or that you're going to talk to Alpha Sixty, like a communication beep, like a. Yeah, like radio but it happens, on, radio off it happens a lot while they're in the hotel. Right, and it seems you, to be apparently random at that point. Yeah. It doesn't it become be clear random. that it's a communication thing until later yeah. in the film when you start seeing it consistently when he's communicating with Alpha 60 or whatever, like the front desk or yeah. whatever. But yeah, yeah during but, that first hotel scene, it's like, where are all the beeps coming from? What's yeah. going on? Yeah, and it's and, and they happen, and there's no indication that such communication is going on by anyone on screen, and it's certainly not happening with our main characters, the people we're actually following at that point. Again, my guess is that is a random noise from the room. Maybe. And that, Maybe. then, like, the director was like, hey, that sounds yeah. pretty futuristic. Maybe I should I was... use that as the communication sound. I was thinking that maybe it might be an indication that Alpha 60 is paying attention, but Could if be. that's true, then none of the questions that Alpha 60 asks Lemmy Caution later to try and get information out of him make sense, because right. if he's been watching the and entire also, time, he already knows what's going on. Well, and it would also appear that possibly Alpha 60's kind of on the nod, because he seems to go in and out of communication 15 times in that hotel scene. It's like, Alpha Maybe. 60, what are you doing? You either Maybe. pay attention or you don't. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Right, because like, we hear it so many times. It's like, what does he keep like zoning out? And he's like, oh man, this guy's really boring. His one point four million uh, million nodes. He can't pay attention to everything. Apparently, <laughs> right? Um, I, yeah, he's like, I'll just I'll just check in on this guy every fifteen minutes and make a really obnoxious loud beep so that he knows I'm paying attention. <laughs> he knows I'm watching. Maruma uh, freaked out. When she heard that sound, she because I was watching on my computer, she's like, "What is that noise? What's going on in our house?" Because those weird penetrating beat noises, it's like really yes. hard to detect the location, right? So she yeah. thought like our microwave was doing something weird. <laughs> it's like, no, it's coming out of this stupid movie. I'm sorry. Uh, well, it's, it doesn't like mean something else in Japan. It's not like the uh, the giant monster warning system, is it? No, it actually is Maybe about the one. sound that my microwave makes when it's finished cooking. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. So it was really like she's like, "What is the microwave <laughs> on? What's going on?" She literally asked me about the microwave because it's very yeah. similar to the microwave sound. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions, one of the questions that that uh, the computer asks, caution is, you know, uh, <laughs> Dave, will you sing with me? <laughs> Yes, 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 Daisy. Daisy, give me your answer <laughs> to. I kind of wish that had happened. Yeah, uh, right. But uh, um, anyway, I should. You know what? Before I before I get into that, I do want to mention all of the fight scenes in this movie. Being a zero, you know, there's there's no budget. Like the elevator fight scene. The elevator fight scene. 
Adam, the, the fight scene in the garage where it's just still <laughs> photos of of, yes. of Caution yes. like holding still this guy in weird positions. <laughs> Caution putting in different Nelsons. And they're both like making modes. funny faces. It's like, yes. what is this like? Uh, like a really cheap like backyard wrestling promotion like poster. <laughs> That's what it looks like. I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> And then, and then, it got, and that, then, the movie got really surreal at that point. Yes. I yes, really, it honestly, did. it sounds strange considering how we've described this film. That is, for me, kind of when the film jumped the shark. <laughs> as far as, like, weirdness. Because, like, I, I think, from that point no, on, no, there's really, people you're clawing right. at the walls and, like, it's well, all, and he can yeah. start using negative, photo negative, which he doesn't use any other yeah. point in the film until after Absolutely. that point. Yeah. And then, and and then you I get think... these weird promotional photos of, like, this big, like, white guy with, like, blonde hair, like, being held. Yeah. And they're both making goofy faces. Yeah. I'm not wrong, and right? They were weird faces. They, they were, were weird making. faces. One thing one thing that, that gets me there is that, um, as far as what's happening, the implication is that Alpha, Alpha after Alpha 60 was destroyed, no one really has control over what they're doing. Right, but that would and imply that, that implies Alpha 60 has that, a direct yeah. link to their brains or something. Yeah, that implies that Alpha 60 has direct control over everyone, and he doesn't. We, yeah, which doesn't make sense with the rest of the story. Yeah, like, yeah, and that is a major control, problem. But that. like, it's like maybe the tranquilizer stopped being distributed, but that's real maybe. quick uptake, man. That means they're yeah. taking like one every twenty-five minutes. That, yeah, that would be like the tranquilizer stopped working. Um, as soon as, <laughs> right, these are our as soon as he died. Yeah, um, and that doesn't make sense. Right, I, so know, there's a lot I of... know the director's trying to get it across that message. I picked that up, but I was like, yeah. and but it's it a doesn't very, make any sense. It's it's an okay, very shorthand way of saying, oh, the society's falling apart without six eh, without. Right, Alpha but they could have shown stock footage of riots and got yeah. the same yeah. thing. But well, riots wouldn't really have made weird. sense on that quick of a turnaround either. Right, so... but at least I did that. At least that shorthand would have been slightly more comprehensible. <laughs> yes, no, that is true. That is true. Um. So anyway, he asks. Uh, he one of the questions he asks is, uh, you know, what it, what lights up the night, and uh, and caution replies poetry. Um, and later we have a scientist tell him that his answers were nonsensical, um, and they're just as nonsensical as anything Alpha Sixty has right, said. Right, right. And then like the scientist tells us that no, we codify like it's it got a little confusing at points like that. But they're yeah. like he has us codify these books right and so clearly yeah. alpha 60 has been exposed to poetry before yeah and, well, and especially it's, since it's, he quotes it all the time yeah it's weird i i get a hint from that and from that scientist that they're uh, that were kind of mocking uh, sociology at that point trying to codify emotion and, and poetry into into this uh scientifically studyable form and uh i don't know if that necessarily works out to reality um, yeah, which well. is one of the problems I have with sociology in general. But uh, like he, it's so maybe we're kind of mocking that at that it's point. It's possible, but, but yeah, like it's weird because it's more like mocking this entire notion that like the human condition is codifiable at all. Yeah, but but at yeah. the same time, again, we do it in such a weird way that the the, the message is lost. The interference yeah. on the way on the line makes the message incomprehensible. Yeah, and the fact that that scene ends with such a weird joke by introducing two other scientists named Heckle and Jekyll. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, what is with <laughs> this <just> film? <laughs> yeah, it just does stuff like that. Yeah, it's... yeah. Heckle and Jekyll, who who barely talk within that scene and never talk after that scene. Except I think one of them is the guy who tells him no journalist as he's sneaking through the building right. at the and end. And then he says, on his journalist and, uh, what is it, justice start with the same letter. It's like... <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> that's... See, and that's, this is this is a good thing. At least, so at least judge, we know that this jury. movie is... Mo- this this movie is, is okay enough that you and I are remembering so much of it. Well, it's, yeah, it's but, a weird thing because, you know, we remembered... Every detail of Beauty and the Beast, too. The ones that <laughs> yes, stick in our craw are the ones that we remember the most. <laughs> the ones like, that we remember. Actually, hate. I remember loving 400 Blows, but I can't really give you a lot of detailed explanation of what happened. Yeah. yeah I, I remember yeah. thinking, I must buy this. And that's all I remember, really. I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. And then this one, just so much is like, what is going on? Well, okay. it's like watching Buckaroo Banzai in the whatever. 
Yes. Was it eight and a half or twenty three and a half? I forget. Eighth, eighth dimension. Yeah, eighth dimension. Um, it, in I love that, that it's movie. like I love it that sticks movie. in your head because it's like it's so incomprehensible. Yeah, it doesn't belong that, there. That you, your brain you have can't to remember this stuff because, so that you can try to process. Right, it. your brain's like, "We'll take care of this when you go to sleep tonight." <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so uh, poetry is what illuminates the night. Uh, then we get it's it's really weird. His whole breaking into the facility when he has his ultimate. Uh, you know, stand off with Von Braun and then kills him and the computer and become, <laughs> accepts his fate as a legend. Uh, there are so many times that he could have easily been stopped on his way in. Oh, like right. that scientist yeah. he talks to, he says, hey, no journalists. He says, journalism and justice. Start with the same Stay letter. <laughs> Start with the same so letter. Go tell your boss. Juxtaposition and, uh... Yes, you know. but then he, then the scientist runs to the front of the line where Von Braun is and tells Von Braun, but everyone still just walks in a normal right. pace. <laughs> and Von and like, he's just, at, he's just at the, he's just at the back of the line. Check out my shaded That's... glasses. Yes, yes. I gotta admit that main <laughs> character not so impressive when he's actually talking, but on those posters, very sinister. Oh yes, I like that. No, that's true. Yes, that's, I like the that's posters. Very nice. They have a very Ho Chi Minh City feel to them. <laughs> if you've ever true, been, there's just posters of Ho Chi Minh everywhere. Everywhere. The post office in downtown has a poster like the size of a car. <laughs> just staring down on the post office. It's awesome. And this is exactly well, the same thing. I loved it. That's really creepy. It's pretty um, awesome. Though. So, uh, so he, he, he destroys the computer. He makes his escape. In <laughs> but he destroys the computer in a way I don't understand. Like, he yeah. gives the, po- the computer a riddle, but I don't remember what the riddle was. Oh, yeah, it's like, what? I don't know. There's two I men standing by either. a door. One of them always lies. <laughs> I don't know. Like, the riddle was it, so, like, this should really just baffled a computer. What? It's, it's like the riddle of the Sphinx, but it's not really that great. <laughs> no, it's like, and like these, like, if, if you figure out the answer, you'll destroy yourself. Because, like, the answer is like love or some bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The answer's, the answer's love. And that's, that's what we get. He, he, he finds Natasha, he rescues her, they drive away, uh, and apparently his Ford Galaxy there's an interstellar highway that someone built because uh, he can just drive back right. to the Why outer lands that are apparently have... a different galaxy. I don't understand. You build this yeah. utopian society and then you connect it with a highway network to the <laughs> barbarian lands? Yes. I don't understand. Yes. It doesn't yes. make any sense. Um... <laughs> and then it snows well, it in sense... the... By the way, I want to point out just, just one more point. Is that yeah. I? It kept flashing south, right? Yeah. Well, I don't speak. North I don't south. speak a de French, and which is why I just used a fake Italian accent. Um, and that was terrible. But thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. I'm trying to be as bigoted as possible whenever we deal with French films, <laughs> because okay. it doesn't really make any sense. Um, but so I don't understand, right? And I didn't get translations on that before and the, yeah i didn't yeah because none of none of the text was translated right i didn't my, actually my, get my it until they showed us the one that means north and i was like that one i could yeah. process because we kind of have a um a cognate right there right yeah and so it's like yeah, oh north. and then it started snowing and i'm like oh so that means north so that other one that kept showing up must have been south <laughs> why did you keep telling yeah. me that <laughs> i already well, knew i was to... in the south why did you have to tell me 1500 times <laughs> If we never changed location, because. we only went north one time. Yeah. Why did you keep telling me we were in the south? And it's weird. It's like it's like we only ever went to that north because they had to do reshoots and it happened to be winter. Right. Exactly. So they so they had to explain that by saying that it's always snowing in the north district and oh, it's always we, sunny in the south. And yeah, it's like or we it's like oh we can't get permits to do these driving sequences until January. Oops. Ugh. Well, um, anyway, so uh, so we get the uh, the poetry wins in a way by Natasha saying that uh, that she uh, she loves him, and that's the final line. But I love how she delivers it because it's so like monotone. Yeah, and right. So, so she's still clearly that, not that it's like she doesn't even believe it. Yeah, yeah. It's so. Yeah. So what do we got here, Adam? Do either of us really want to watch this film ever again? 
I, I don't think I really I do, I uh, unless I'm trying to fall asleep 15 minutes after I start a thing. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, this is great. Because that's, that's what's well, happening. but in that sense, every, you could just go pop in 2001 A Space Odyssey, and at least you'd have a good film on while you pass out. Yeah, but then I'd wake up in the last 20 minutes when it starts to get loud. Yeah, that's true. That's always... That I, happened, should, I do not know how many times that's happened to me. Yeah. It's so yeah. weird, because you get, like, a three-hour nap. It's actually pretty yeah. much perfect. And then, and then you just wake up. I actually, I fell asleep once with sci-fi on watching, uh, oh, I can't remember what movie, uh, Christopher Reeves is in it. It's about a bunch of women get impregnated at the same time when their children are all blonde haired, blue eyes, psychics. Really? I've never um, heard of this film. Uh, I did, it's, it's, I honestly can't remember what it's called, but I fell asleep watching that and 2000, uh, you know, the sequel, 2000, okay. whatever. 2010 I don't know. came on and it, it opens mm. it opens with a scene of the space fetus and someone uh, saying my god it's full of stars over and over again and it is so loud that I just shot bolt up right <laughs> in the middle of the night <laughs> wondering what the heck was going on yeah we yeah this is <laughs> anyway. this is not anyway so we're, since we're talking about since we're talking about bad sci-fi sequels to good sci-fi films i think it's time we pull this yeah, conversation into, into Alpha a Bill, close. not the best film i've Alpha ever Bill's seen kind of meh we didn't uh, there's there's a lot of good going on for it there's yeah, a lot especially of bad in the cinematography there's some neat stuff going on yeah. and also yeah. in the wrestling promotion shots yes, yes those are also quite classy shots. Yeah, all of the fighting sequences are just... Yeah, bouncing around in the elevator. There's there's bouncing around in the elevator as if people are punching him back and forth, but we don't actually see anyone punching him. And it really doesn't come (laughs) off as punchy. It comes off as like... Yeah. Like like maybe a four-year-old in an elevator running back and forth between the sides. Yeah. Like he's just He's jumping off the walls himself. Uh, Anyway. Anyway. Join us next time. We'll be watching uh, John McKenzie's The Long Good Friday... Uh, which stars Bob Hoskins in his mm. breakout role. So uh, get ready for a lot of Super Mario Brothers jokes. Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriterion at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriterion.com.